Welcome everybody um, to Applied Math at Northwestern uh, to our info session. Um, so I'm Herman Rieke, I'm chair of the department and I will you know, say a few things and then we will have um, um, other people chime in and uh, present more details. So maybe I should introduce at this point. Um, so I don't, of course, I don't know where these people show up on your screen. So there's Professor Volpert, he is the, on the admissions office, so to speak. He's the uh, uh, admissions officer. Uh -huh. And then on the screen yeah. below, yeah. I see Dave Chop, who is former chairman and is one of our faculty working in compute, computation. And next to him on my screen is Daniel Lee Kone, also a faculty member who's also uh, working in computation. And they will tell you more about what they're doing later. And I also see Bill Kath on the top right, who is uh, working in uh, quantitative biology, and who will talk about that. And, uh, later. So let's see. Um, so the way we, we structured that this whole thing is meant to be very informal. So please, uh, we're not many people. So if you have a question, don't wait until some time is to ask a question or raise your Zoom hand or something like that. Just blurt it out. It's uh, it, it, otherwise, you know, it's easy to overlook somebody's question. So please, uh, just anytime ask um, <clears throat> when you have a question. Oh, so uh, here's also uh, Neil Mangan, faculty member who's talking, will talking also about uh, biological systems and synthetic biology. And I think from, oh no, we're, we're still missing one faculty member, but we'll, he's gonna talk towards the end, so it's not a problem. Okay, anyway, so um, actually, I mean, of course you don't have to uh, use your camera. Uh, if you ever have, had any the privilege of teaching people or, or communicating with many people on Zoom, you know that it's much nicer to talk to people who don't who actually have a face rather than just a name on a screen because, but as I said, you know, do whatever makes you comfortable. Okay, so let me just give a few initial words about applied math, the way we, we do it or we see it, because there are diff many different ways one can do uh, applied math. Uh, and so let me just give a little bit, uh, some facets for that. And then uh, the very other- Herman? Pardon? Did you want to record it? Y yeah. Oh, it is recording. It is, rec it is supposed to be. So uh, I. So the plan is we want to post this on, on, on this info sessions website. Uh, so, um, but we will uh, cut out if people, individual people speak, we will cut cut you out unless you want to be on it. But uh, I mean, so it's not, the point is we just want to have some, you know, opportunity for other people who couldn't join to have, like, please listen in. Anyway, okay, right. So now just to make sure uh, I, I am sharing my screen, right? So you can see um, the wonderful Northwestern purple information session. Okay, so let's get started. Second. Here we go. So, as I said, so I will first say a few words about applied math and modeling because this modeling is like a keyword that goes to pretty much all the research we do here. And uh, then these various faculty members will talk about their spe specialty or give an insight there. Okay, so essentially, just to remind you, or that, you know, math is a is a very powerful language, right? I mean, it's uh, you can use it, and we do all use it for describing various kinds of science. You know, we understand physical systems and biological systems and increasingly also societal systems with using mathematical tools. And so an important aspect is that we want to understand the world, but also once we understand the world or when, once you understand aspects of it, you can also use math then in an engineering context where you're interested in like designing machines or you de develop new technology or new processes in the hope that you would improve um, our world. So it's a, uh, both facets are very important. And applied math is sort of really a tool that plays a, a very important role in this context. And so let me just say, sort of give you a little snippet, you know, how we think of how applied math comes in there. So, you know, all the things we want to describe and understand and design are relatively complicated, they're complex. And so we want to come up with a description which is simple enough that we can actually understand it, whatever that means. That's a tricky question, but you know, so it has to be somewhat simpler than the real system. But it should be um, 
still faithful with respect to the relevant features, right? And so we develop a mathematical model, which can be just algebraic equations or differential equations or what have you. And we can develop them either from fundamental laws or from measurements or other data that we collect somehow. And then we come up with a model. And so then as applied mathemat mathematicians, we then use all the tools that we have our at our disposal to analyze these models. And so we use tools that are available or we develop new tools that are necessary for the model at hand or for the analysis at hand. And then the third step, which is also very important for us is we're not happy with just having a solution for the model, but we wanna now conclude things from the solution and bring these results back to, as we say, the application area. So we wanna really answer questions that are relevant for the people working in say a physical system or in biology or something. So we don't wanna have just some equation and say, well, this is the end. No, we wanna really contribute to understanding and to designing in the engineering context. And so in order to do that, we typically collaborate with scientists and engineers, and you'll hear from the various faculty members now um, what this means in the various um, aspects. So as I said, so we have uh, these faculty members talk about, talk about their um, research or an aspect of research that they want to highlight. And um, as I said, you know, please feel free to interrupt if you, if you have questions now or even when they present their thing don't don't hesitate to to ask questions okay so according to our list we said we'll bill will talk first so if that's okay well let's just do that how about bill you take over i stop my share okay and hopefully everybody can see that yes okay so um, I'm going to talk just very briefly, not a lot of details about research at the interface between mathematics and biology. And um, get the focus. So the question is, you know, why is this an opportune time? And my view of it is just basically because there's lots and lots of data that is coming online in the biological area. Other places too, but this is one in particular. And it's basically been driven by, you know, every time computers get cheaper, people add automated, you know, experimental apparatus to their labs. And so th this is just producing this wealth of information that's available. And people want all kinds of help at understanding what this data means. And uh, so this is a list uh, of some of the things that people in the department do. It's by no means comprehensive. And I probably am not doing justice to the specifics of what my colleagues do. Um, these are application areas. As Herman said, we all like collaborating with uh, people in other disciplines. Uh, so Herman and I both work in neuroscience. Uh, Neil works in synthetic biology. Um, Madhavmani, who's <clears throat> not here today, works in morphogenesis development and ecology. Uh, Dave Chop, one of the things he does is biofilm modeling, et cetera. Bio, uh, biological and social systems, Dave Abrahams, population dynamics, uh, Alvin Bayless and Voloja Volpert, and um, Mike Mixus and Pecha Vlahoska work on biofluids and soft matter. And there's other, all kinds of other areas that people work in. And um, there's another big opportunity that's just starting now uh, that our department is affiliated with. So previously we had a center funded by the National Science Foundation and the Simons Foundation. And we teamed up with the University of Chicago to form a National Institute for Theory and Mathematics and Biology. And this is funded again by NSF and the Simons Foundation. And there will be one of these in the, in the country and it'll be uh, centered in Chicago. <clears throat> and a lot of the people in the department are involved along with many other faculty from the from the two schools. And um, there will be, um, the, the Institute will be located in the downtown Chicago area on the 35th floor of one of the buildings in the downtown Chicago area. And this was a artist rendering that was created, um, uh, you know, for the site visit from NSF and the Simons Foundation showing what uh, the view will look like from, from the space. So it's not created yet. This won't be available for a year. 
uh, but and it may not look exactly like this, but I guarantee the view will look like this because it already does. And so the question is, you know, um, why work at the interface of mathematics and biology? And, uh, you know, my opinion is there's lots of new and exciting opportunities. There's tons of data that biologists want uh, help understanding. And it's a field that's likely not to cool down uh, anytime soon because the advances keep coming as we speak. And the other thing is that biologists uh, want models that explain mechanisms. They're really interested in, you know, what happens when something changes or, um, you know, if I intervene with a drug or some other type of perturbation, what happens to the system? And mathematical models are really ideal for this. It isn't just data analysis. They really want to understand cause and effect in these systems. And that's basically it. I need to give time to my colleagues. So I will stop for questions if anybody has them and or we can take them at the end and uh, and move on to somebody else that wants to talk. Well, okay. I knew that Bill would do a very nice presentation that leaves everybody floored and speechless. So that's okay. You can recover and ask. You can still ask him later if you want. He'll still be here later. Okay. So then let's maybe move on to Professor Neil Mangan, and she'll tell us her perspective on how we think about our um, program and our research activities. All right. Are you seeing the right thing or the wrong thing? <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm going to just tell you about some ideas that I'm excited about uh, that my group is working on. So kind of one of our overarching uh, areas of research is data-driven model construction for dynamical systems. So this applies- No, we're to seeing presenter view. Oh, we are. That's what I thought. All right. Uh, all right, just a second. Well, at least was no embarrassing comment on the presenter notes. That... Uh, it helps if you set it to show it a window and then uh, just show the window. Yeah, I, 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 I think it. there's a question. I don't know if it's yeah, there worth, is. I think it's uh, for oh. responding oh, now. Yeah, so just, yeah. sorry, I do know how to use Zoom. One of my students was saying to me today that uh, when I get old, I should pretend I don't know how to use Zoom. But it's obvious that uh, I don't have to wait. All right, now what are you saying? <laughs> Same thing. Same thing. All right. Oh, so, so it's somebody, a child's note. I'm sorry, I don't know how to say your last name. How do you say your last name? All right, we're just going to do it in presenter view because um, that's going to be easier. Okay, so one of the classes of, of methods that we've been developing are these data-driven methods for model selection or sparse model selection. And my overarching uh, kind of worldview here is that I want to be able to define model libraries that are... Um, based in what is known physically and biologically about the systems, and then um, take those model libraries, combine them with data. So this is meant to enumerate everything that could possibly be physically happening in the systems and uh, undergo some sort of sparse model selection, meaning a down selection of those possibilities uh, to identify a subset of models or an ensemble that will that is suggested by the data to best fit the experiment. And um, I, we're really interested then in also doing uncertainty quantification, not just on the parameters in those models, but also across which model is most likely, um, and then do experimental design. So suggest new experiments, refine the model library in order to uh, improve that down selection in an iterative process. And from the mathematical perspective, um, this is like a really cool problem because there's a lot of connections and interfaces in mathematics between information theory, experimental design, uh, nonlinear optimization, just what is sparsity? Like how do you define the objective of, of down selecting simple equations that you would like to down select? And uh, the dynamical systems theory of the data that you're getting is coming from some system, system that has structure and that is defining the optimization problem that you're trying to solve. Um, so my, my group, works on a variety of different applications. And I'm just gonna show you the ones that we're, we're sort of, we have funding and are still growing in. So first you've already heard about 
biological problems, but two questions that I'm very interested in uh, that are motivated by um, synthetic biology, which you can substitute as bioengineering rather than synthetic biology, but it's kind of like the newest wave of bioengineering. Um, so one question is how and why do bacteria organize their metabolism or their chemical reactions in time and space? And so there's both natural questions of why do they do this out in the wild, but then there's there are engineering questions of what would be the best way to do this in so that you can actually produce a, a product like a biofuel or you know, something else. Um, and then the another question that I've been working on is, can we design genetic programs for mammalian cells to process dynamic signals? So this is a, a genetic circuit design problem. There's lots of people who've done genetic circuit design. The thing that's really cool about this particular problem is that my collaborator works in mammalian cells, mammalian cells, so human cells are just harder than bacteria. Uh, and they also have this interesting, well, many populations of cells have heterogeneity in how they will express or how they will, um, uh, you know, produce the circuit that you're trying. But uh, my collaborator here, Josh Leonard, is really interested in how to take advantage of that heterogeneity in the populations. For example, to have one subpopulation that does one task and another subpopulation that does another task, rather than treating heterogeneity or variability as a bad thing that we're trying to get rid of. Um, then just to bring up something that's not biology and also is a, a growth area I'm hoping in my group over the next couple of years, we work on uh, sustainability in problems in chemistry and materials. Um, so one per problem I'm actively working on with somebody in the chemistry department is understanding electrocatalysis and, as a multi-scale process. So how do you um, transport the, the nano environment that's right at the catalyst surface, all of these complex things that are moving around and charged and diffusing, um, how does that interrelate with the the efficiency of the chemical reactions that are happening at the surface of the electrocatalyst? Um, and then a problem that I worked on when I was a postdoc uh, and I'm interested in sort of revisiting now is can we identify dominant loss mechanisms in solar cells from electrical measurements? So this actually maps back to that model selection problem of can we use model selection tools to automatically identify what is going on in the electronic properties of materials, um, and specifically the things that are going on that we don't like, so that we can go in and engineer and fix them in, in optoelectric type materials. Um, underlying all of these are, are PDE reaction diffusion transport type problems, so uh, the math is also fun. Um, and then just to give you a snapshot of my group, this is my current group grouped into the projects they work on. You'll notice we also have a COVID problem. Uh, I'm, I am still working on that, but I'm not recruiting anyone. Uh, so, uh, thank you. Any, any questions? What, anybody have questions for? There's one in the chat. Right. There, yes, okay. Bill. So Charles is asking whether there are research interest in the area of computational hemodynamics in our department. So. I mean, Well, so I mean, I, right now, um, so Mike Mixis and I did some a while back, but we are not doing that presently. Um, I don't know if anybody in the, I mean, the the institute that Bill Kath was talking about is is new, so I don't know if anybody is in there doing it now. Um, my guess is not, but I don't know. There is um, there is one person uh, from the med school that actually talked at our kickoff workshop, so Luisa Arispe from the medical oh. school. So she's participating and does that. But I don't think there's anybody in our department that started a collaboration with her, but but there are people that do fluids here and it would, would yeah, potentially right. be possible. She, she's right. actually very interested in having a collaborator. Yeah. Um, should I go ahead? Anything else? Any other questions, comments? We're all too intimidating. <laughs> I'll so, change that. But we're just these little little rectangular things on a screen, right? I mean, <laughs> one little band-aid would take care of that and nobody would see us anymore. So <laughs> anyway. Um all right. oh, here's I saw a, there's a, oh, here's there was a, another question that just popped up about oh, geophysical, geophysical fluid dynamics. That's for you, Danny. I, I have and, worked on the Daniel. Daniel and Daniel, right? 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. But uh, not to the extent that Daniel is, so not on the computational modeling, but on kind of more abstracted mathematical modeling of geophysical fluids, specifically groundwater flow. Uh, it's been years for me since I've worked on that, but I still have some interest in it. Um, so there's a chance I'll come back to that. I don't know, Daniel, do you have comments? Uh, wait a few minutes, then you'll have more. <laughs> oh, that's how fast you generate new research? <laughs> um, I see another question about the sense of community in the department. I think that's a good question also to ask grad students. But at least to me, among the faculty, we're a great community. I think we all get along very well. When you get to bigger departments, often there are factions or sub sub fields within the department, but we don't have that generally. I wouldn't call them factions, though. Well, in some departments, I think that's the right word, but <laughs> thankfully not in ours. So, so the I think the way to think of it is that one of the common elements of everybody in the department is we all like to collaborate with other people but it's basically evolved that sometimes uh some of us will collaborate with the same person but often many of us will collaborate with different people and so you know we share um we, we discuss things on the mathematical side but the applications are often different that we work on I think from the student side, um, one thing to which maybe call you, Daniel. Daniel's right that you need to ask one of our graduate students, but but um, I will say that they have a a fairly tight knit group and um, they meet regularly with their um, uh, the student tea and and other activities um, that uh, that are out of the you know that that uh, the faculty don't join in, but then we also have events. Um, on campus where we're we're all involved. So um, so uh, I think we all um, uh, get along fairly well. Um, students to students, students to faculty and faculty to faculty. Yeah, you know, I mean students have, have various outings. I remember I went to the Museum of Science Industry one one year and uh, you know to a shed aquarium. I mean so they you know just yeah. so we try to foster that to the extent we can as in you know paying for that we can we can fund these uh, um, events and similarly with the student tea, you know, so, they, so we're trying to foster that as much as we can, let's just say it that way. I, maybe just as an anecdote about students supporting each other, one of my students just recently went on a job, the job market, and so was giving a talk uh, for, for uh, and he, he organized getting a bunch of people together to listen to his talk, and uh, I was invited last. Um, and by the time I got to the slide deck to like leave comments, uh, which he was doing a Google Slides thing. So he was kind of soliciting many comments from people at the same time. I, by the time I showed up, it was something like five different people had already left detailed comments about all of his slides just from the, across the other graduate students, postdocs, you know, people who, often people who had already uh, interviewed and experienced this already. So. I had nothing to do with organizing that, but it seemed like there was a strong sense of support and camaraderie. Um, I know they also ask each other to read read things. So often I see things after they've already edited. Um, so I think another aspect to keep in mind too is that there's also connections between current students and, and former students. So um, we will, uh, I, I, I frequently hear of stories of students that have um, been in contact with with alums who um, who have either guided them toward a particular job application or um, uh, or I mean there are certain places where we seem to have a lot of alumni go and I think it's because we have one or two alumni that started there and then they keep recruiting from our program so uh, so there's also that kind of connection that um, the alumni network is is um, is very helpful too. Actually, I just got just an incidental story. Just yesterday, I got a message from Chris Vogel, who was who was an alum, student in our department, who's now at Los, Al Los Alam not Los Alamos, Lawrence Livermore Lab, and he wants to come by and see, talk to students because there's positions out there, and he wants to, just like the job said, you know, keep that uh, connection going. Yep. That's a good place to be. Oh, there's okay. Charles has another question yet, right? What do you look out for in a potential candidate? 
uh, who who wants to venture that? I I think I mean so um, I think for a lot of us I'm not going to speak for everybody, but um, doing well in courses is something that is a big you know green flag that is like you know okay you're doing well in your classes that's something I want to pay attention to. Um, doing well in the classes that well for me personally if you're doing well in the class that i'm teaching i will see you more and i will appreciate more what your abilities are um, um but also i think uh the other factor is just um you know everybody has a different skill set and so um the type of student that that i would be looking for may be very different from what somebody else may be looking for and so um um, and so, you know, I'm looking for, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested in people that are interested in biology and computation. So, um, you know, that's not for everybody. Um, but, uh, but obviously interest in that area makes, would make a lot of sense too. I think the question was also aimed at what we look for in, in people who apply to the program, not, you know, once ah. they're here and want to, uh, join a group, but rather the application. And so I guess, um, Volodya, do, do you want to say something? Because you you read most of the application. You're the person who reads most reads most of the application. I think that uh, what I usually look at is a good background, a relevant background, and interest in research. Because our department is basically a research department. It's not just a teaching uh, unit. And we want our graduate students to do research. And we want them to be interested in doing research, not just doing research, because they're required to do research. So these are things I'm looking at. Of course, I'm looking at recommendation letters. I look at everything. But these are main two things, the background and interest in doing research, which is, I, you can see there that a person already did some research and it was interesting research. Or a person maybe did not do research. This is how things work out, but is interested, really interested in doing research. So that kind of things. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also fair to say, you know, it's not every not everybody has the opportunity to do a lot of research depending on what at what school you are, right? I mean, on Northwestern, okay, people seems like 50% of the undergrads take do some research, which is amazing, but other schools don't offer that. So if you don't have that, but that's not that's not a deciding factor, but I think one can see from an application and from the essay and stuff, whether somebody is just generally interested, you know, like if somebody has, I, I, you know, to say it in simple words, like some drive, you know, you want to see, oh, there's somebody who's, who, you know, he, he, he or she will, will just, Go for things, and even you know, even if it's sort of a, not apparent in even in 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 math, right? Someone can see people. Some people have just some drive doing other stuff. So, so I think that's what I would, if if you're thinking about what you want to put in an essay or something like that, that that's something I would keep in mind. Even if you if you think it has nothing to do with math, but but it shows that you are dedicated to something that would count for something. Okay, but as Bill said, maybe what we should do is we should first now listen, you know, to Bill to Dave to the other three people and uh, for these general questions, and, and then after that come back with general questions. But I don't want to discourage any anybody from from asking. Still, well, there there is oh, one yeah, more there question. There's actually a question for Neil so. specifically, right? So somebody, uh, David uh, says he, his mic is not working, so here here it goes for for Neil. I In the Oh, you can read it. I'll read it slowly. In the domain of modeling dynamic systems, can you give any more examples about particular projects that you and your students are working on at this exact moment right now? Yes. yes. So, so, maybe, so maybe you, uh, can, the, I mean, you can tell them about your talk next week. Uh, sure. I mean, I can. It's on wastewater, though, which I, uh, so I'm, I'm giving a talk it's next after week. After lunch. So it's not so bad. Yeah. Um, one of the so most of the dynamic systems modeling that is just forward modeling that we do and also the, the data-driven model selection uh, is for metabolic and regulatory networks, which as term in terms of dynamical systems, you know, they mostly go to fixed points or oscillates or mostly interested in like transients to fixed points, maybe oscillations, 
um, very interested in, in uh, you know, how many different solutions. We don't do super intense like bifurcation theory or anything like that on these systems though. Uh, maybe we should. Um, but uh, in terms of the data-driven work, we do a lot on what we would call test cases. So we look at systems like the Lorenz system or other chaotic oscillator systems as test systems to see if we're going to be able to recover those kind of systems from data. Um, so those are actually for us less connected with a particular experiment, but they are an interesting case study in, you know, if, if we have a dynamical system that has a different attracting manifold than a fixed pit point or a cycle, what, uh, what, what is different about doing the model selection for those type of structures? Um, so, and then, yeah, the wastewater example is a really terrible network problem, <laughs> but there's dynamics on it. So I, yeah, I guess we do that as a dynamical systems problem. Okay, so maybe, maybe we, we give Dave Chop to a okay. moment to tell us and then that will, that will trigger more questions. All right, um, can everybody see that okay? Um, Okay, so I only have a couple of slides. I, I'll, I, I've been tasked with uh, providing some information about the computing landscape in, in our program. Um, so there's, I've got two slides. The first one is about research. You've heard a little bit about what we've done, what we've been up to. Um, but I want to say that, that, that um, you know, when um, uh, Professor Rike was talking about, you know, the complicated models that we end up with that we have to address as mathematicians. Um, sometimes we can do analytic methods, sometimes we can do approximation methods. And the third avenue um, for us to solve these problems is with uh, uh, numerical methods. And so that's uh, one of the areas that I'm uh, particularly interested in. Um, and so we have a, a, a fairly robust group in scientific computing here. Um, and in terms of um, the research aspects, um, I think the people that are doing more uh, numerical methods and um, and methods development would be uh, Professor Bayless, who is not on, on the session today, um, myself and Daniel Lacone, who you're going to be hearing from next. Um, and so, but but everyone has at some point some uh, uh, you know even if even if they're not doing methods development, they are still using. Uh, computing tools and numerical methods to address their research. And so I listed a number of people here, Professors Kath and Mangan, who you've, you've heard from already, Mike Mixus, who isn't here, Professor Rike. Um, I mean, a lot of people have um, involved, um, use either um, computing or in particular high performance computing, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, as part of their research. And I've just illustrated, oh, I didn't get the movie started here, but um, there we go. Um, so um, on the left is uh, a movie from some of my biofilm research, which has to do with, um, uh, <laughs> I guess, kind of uh, tied to what Neil was talking about. This is wastewater streams and, and looking at um, uh, uh, electricity generation from waste streams. So um, anyway, the, the, the white lines are the biofilms that are growing and, and, the, um, and the background is acetate, which is the, which is the the waste product that is being reduced by the bacteria to produce electricity. So, anyway, so this was a, a question about how whether what happens to these uh, these uh, anodes, which are these brushes of um, uh, carbon fiber brushes, that where the electricity is generated, but when they when the biofilms grow, they clog the system, and we were trying to understand the clogging process. Um, so that's what that uh, video is about. The other one, um, I'm not going to say a whole lot about because Daniel's going to be talking about it next. But it has to do with uh, the uh, fluid flow in uh, in a star, um, in convective flow. So um, I let him discuss that when he when he gets there. But the point is that um, we have uh, a fair a fairly uh, a fair amount of of uh, high performance computing research going on here. Um, in terms of equipment, um, we have a, a department. Um, so in the university itself has a uh, a high performance cluster. Um, last time I checked, it's around 10,000 cores, but I, it's probably more than that now um, because the cores have gotten bigger. Um, but in any case, we have we have access to that system 
for doing um, research. We also have uh, GPU machines in the department that we use both for research and for uh, instructional purposes. And so those are all available to people um, doing research in the department. So, um, so we have ample computing resources um, for, for that. Um, and um, so anyway, so that's, that's sort of the research side of things. And then um, let's see, can I get this to go to the next slide, maybe? Oh, what did happen there? Um, boy, this is really slow. Can did that is that slide appearing? We're there just we go. There we go. There. Okay. No I'm not sure why it was taking so long, but anyway. Um, okay. So in terms of training, um, we do have a fair amount of courses in numerical methods to prepare people, prepare students for. Uh, doing this type of research. And so I've listed some of the courses, the main ones that everyone takes. Uh, the first one is one, one that all of our students incoming take, which is the finite difference methods for partial differential equations. Um, I've taught that many times. Daniel Lacone has been teaching that. Uh, Professor Bayless has been teaching that. So anyway, there's that's, that's a, a, a base level course. We also have spectral methods, which is some of the stuff that Daniel Lacone is doing and also what uh, Professor Bayless uses. Um, we also have a course that is offered every year on uh, uh, methods for random processes. So this is uh, Monte Carlo methods and uh, stochastic differential equations and that, that sort of thing. Um, we have iterative methods for elliptic equations. That's a, a, a an essential tool for solving linear systems um, and for doing um, and, and, and is a subsidiary to a lot of the methods that we do. Uh, for example, in the biofilm research, um, you have to solve for the the distribution of the of the substrates, the 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 food sources that are uh, present in the system, and so you have to solve an elliptic equation to, um, every time step in order to to be able to advance in time. Um, we also have uh, I mean, we have literally written the book on on uh, teaching high performance computing, and I've put a, a picture of the textbook that came out of our department um uh, on the screen there so in the spring of your first year you would you can take uh, the high performance computing class we cover uh, c programming so if you don't have uh, computing experience beyond matlab before beforehand that's okay i will teach you c i will teach you mpi which is for doing work on distributed clusters and i will teach you cuda which is for doing gpu uh, uh, gpu programs and you will actually solve some pdes you know, using all three methods in one quarter. So um, it's uh, it's an intensive course, but um, it really gets everybody up to speed. And the nice thing is that as a result of this, we've seen much more usage of high performance computing in, in students' research because they're now familiar with how to access the systems and um, take advantage of their capabilities. Um, we also have some specialized courses. Uh, I've got my course on uh, numerical methods for moving interfaces, which is level set methods. Not that you need to know what that is. I would teach it to you. Um, and then you've heard a little bit. Uh, Neil Mangan has a course that um, is that is uh, related to her research, which is the data driven methods for dynamical systems. So we have a course on that that she presents. And then we have additional topics um, that uh, that come up from time to time. Um, I've taught courses on hyperbolic conservation laws. Um, I would love to do a course on uh, uncertainty quantification at some point. Um, it won't be next year, but maybe the year after. Um, anyway, so there's additional special topics that come up. So um, in any case, there are um, a, a lot of opportunities for learning about um, uh, doing scientific computing and implementing it for research purposes. Um, and the, the applications are all over the board. So um, so we have no limitations on that. So um, I will stop there and uh, take any questions that anybody might have. Ah, okay, so there's a question about um, special topics on uh, CFD. So um, there is a course, so we don't teach that course, but we have a course, um, that uh, many of our students take, well, I mean, the students that are interested in fluids will take a course in uh, CFD from um, the mechanical engineering department. And so um, and so, I have had students that take that course. It's pretty common. Um, and you will get certainly some CFD. Uh, I, I presume that, you know, Daniel will talk a little bit about that uh, more. So um, uh, 
you know, that that's that's something that 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 will develop and you will learn it from him if you wanted to learn it. Um, but there are op there are openings for that um, uh, in our in our program. Um, let's see. Oh, Neil, that's Neil's. <laughs> okay, those aren't questions; those are responses. Okay, so I just want to point out because somebody okay. had a question about professional development, and Neil gave a detailed response, yeah. which is worth reading. So, and Bill well, Kathak just sent a, put a link into graduate school events hmm. in that context. Sorry, Dave, did you talk about data assimilation courses too? Well, I, I mentioned yours. I, I, I right, right, right. Yeah. So yeah, so the data driven methods class does cover some amount of data assimilation, yeah. but I think that some of the optimization courses that are in IEMS would That's also true. cover yeah. uh, data assimilation, assimilation. So we don't yeah. we don't sort of house optimization courses. We have some real big experts in optimization at Northwestern who are in industrial uh, engineering and lots of our students take those classes. Anything else? Do you want to do want to hear from Daniel Lecone about stuff in the in the skies? Okay, there we go. Hopefully, everyone can hear me. Uh, hi, I'm Daniel. Um, so uh, I guess my group works on kind of two different types of things. Um, one is uh, numerical methods, uh, and then the other thing is the application of those methods to, um, to to different scientific problems. So, so the main methods that I work on are uh, uh, spectral methods. So, I'm one of the core developers of a code called Daedalus. Um, so, uh, um, so, so, so Dave mentioned this. Um, uh, just a few moments ago. So this is an open source code written in Python. Um, uh, it can be run on uh, your laptop all the way to supercomputers. And the way that works is that you type in an equation that you want to solve, and then it solves it for you. Um, uh, so I just want to give a little example of that. So um, one of my favorite uh, examples is um, a fluid dynamics example of Rayleigh Bernard convection. Um, so, so this is so this is a Python script that if you install the code and uh, and you run it, it'll it'll run a simulation, and then uh, you can make a movie of it, which kind of looks like this. Um, so it's maybe not too exciting, but um, this is just what you would get from running on your laptop for a couple of minutes. The uh, the the way that the code works in terms of actually using the code is that you uh, you first specify the domain that you want to solve your PDE on, and then you have to uh, write down the PDE. And the way that you do that is that you specify it as, as strings. So, um, uh, so ju just to uh, uh, very quickly explain how this works, um, uh, we're solving uh, incompressible hydrodynamics. Um, in the interest of time, any anytime you see a tau, ignore it. Um, so here, uh, this is the incompressibility constraint. So the trace of the gradient of view, that's to say the divergence of the velocity is zero. Then um, the next equation is going to be our um, uh, advection diffusion equation for the buoyancy or temperature of B. Um, so uh, the time derivative of B minus kappa times the Laplacian of B. And then we have our nonlinear term here. So the at symbol is a dot product. So it's U dot grad B. And then for the velocity, we have the time derivative of the velocity minus the viscosity times the velocity of the velocity plus the gradient of the pressure. Uh, this is the buoyancy force. And then our nonlinear uh, u dot grad u term. And then um, and then you apply boundary conditions and, uh, and you run the script and it gives you a movie like this. So that's, um, so that's, that's kind of how, oh, uh, can, uh, could, could, could everyone see that? Did, did that come out okay? Okay. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so some people in my group are trying to um, uh, to extend uh, the numerical methods that we have implemented in this code. Um, so it, it can be solved. It can be used to solve problems across fields. 
so it has been used to solve problems in biology, um, fluid dynamics, um, uh, let's see, uh, plasma physics, condensed matter physics, uh, across, across a wide range of fields. So, um, so there are people in my group who are developing uh, new methods or um, trying to develop new algorithms that get put into this code. Uh, at this point, we have almost 300, 300 publications that have been uh, written with this code. Um, and, and it really kind of got started maybe, uh, say, like uh, six or seven years ago. Um, uh, now, the, the other aspect of my work is, is uh, people in my group uh, use the code to work on specific scientific problems. And one of the um, and the, the the main scientific problems that I work on are problems in uh, astrophysical and also geophysical fluid dynamics. So uh, in terms of astrophysical fluid dynamics, uh, we're trying to understand the fluid flows that occur within stars. And then on the geophysical fluid dynamics side, we're trying to understand flows that are occurring uh, in the cores of planets and also in the ocean or in the atmosphere. So to give a little example, let's see if I can um, if I can share screen. Okay, so I'm going to try to play a movie, maybe. Okay, so this is uh, this is a simulation that was run in my group um, recently, and this is uh, this is kind of our best guess of what's going on inside of the core of a star that's very massive. So this is a star that's. Um, uh, 15 times as, as massive as the sun. And in the inner part of the star, you have uh, large scale bulk fluid motions, um, uh, which, uh, drive, uh, which are driven by turbulent convection. Um, and then in the outer part, I'm not sure how well this comes out on Zoom, but uh, there's, um, there's a bunch of waves that get generated by that. Um, so, uh, so, so, so this is a pretty serious simulation. It was run on 16,000 cores. So uh, this is run um, on a national super supercomputer, um, uh, which is run by by NASA. If you so, so it's a NASA Pleiades computer. If you saw the movie The Martian, that's the computer that they use in that movie. Um, uh, so so we uh, so we, we we run these simulations and then try to understand what's going on because the the problem with these questions in astrophysical and geophysical fluid dynamics is that you can never run with the parameters of the real system. So we always run a series of simulations, try to get an idea of what's going on, and then use that, uh, use the understanding that we gain from the simulations to make some extrapolation to what we think might be happening in the, in the, real, uh, in the real system. Uh, in this case, uh, what we are particularly interested in is uh, these waves. Because if you look at one of these stars very carefully, you'll notice that the brightness of the star varies with time. And there was an idea that 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 those variations might be due to uh, might be due to these waves that are excited by these uh, large scale convective motions in the center of the star. And uh, um, so 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 that's kind of the the style of questions that that we're trying to answer. And uh, and this is um, uh, uh, there's uh, as Bill mentioned earlier. Uh, it's always good to be in a field where there's lots of new data, and that's exactly the case that we're in uh, in uh, in the study of stars in astrophysics, because there's uh, lots of telescopes that are getting put up into space now that look very carefully at stars and measure their brightness uh, with exquisite um, precision at very high time cadence, uh, and that's uh, mostly to detect um, uh, extra solar planets uh, orbiting those stars but it also gives us uh, lots of really interesting information about the stars themselves. And uh, we're, we're trying to kind of uh, harness some of that data uh, together with these simulations to understand what's going on out there. So I think I will stop there, um, but I'd be happy to answer any questions about that if anyone has questions now or later. Okay. And let's maybe switch gears significantly and uh, hear from Daniel Abrams, see where he's taking us. Um, okay, I 
Sorry, let me start by apologizing for being late here, actually to the earlier question about like, um, maybe about community in the department. Uh, one of my former students was visiting uh, and giving a talk at Northwestern Institute for Complex Systems. So uh, I'm co, which I'm co-director of actually. And, um, and so that's a natural connection for me because I work on what I would call complex systems in general um and uh i'm gonna give you some examples of topics of research of mine that are uh applications to social systems i think that's somewhat of a distinction from from other faculty who've talked today but um but i before just to preface that i also am interested in some more traditional applied math areas like uh studying dynamical systems and coupled oscillators synchronization and pattern formation but I have some slides here that I'll share uh, if you give me a second on social systems in particular. Um, hopefully that's visible. Um, so this is from an, er uh, an earlier talk I've given on the topic. And so to keep it brief, I might skip over a few things. But um, in the background of this title slide uh, is a a relatively early um, painting by Pete Mondrian, the uh, the artist who I see has uh, some of his work in the background uh, of Neil's room as well. Um, the the type of work that's more he's more well known for. So, so my focus is on generating kind of mathematical models, and particularly in this area, models for um, for uh, social systems. So. I'll start with what is a model and then what is a social system. So there are all different interpretations of what it means to model something. So a conceptual model might be in the context of like uh, why people are left-handed. There's this thing called the fighting hypothesis that left-handers are uh, preserved in humans because we occasionally, it's occasionally useful when people fight, though most of the time it's a disadvantage when people cooperate. Similar things like the handicap principle for why animal ornaments like antlers exist. Um, they signal fitness and therefore they must be a handicap to survival. Otherwise, anyone could grow them, even the animals that aren't fit. So they're often conceptual in nature, like uh, like in that picture, some boxes and arrows. Um, statistical and econometric models are more like, um, like linear regression or machine learning. Um, and so if you're presented with data, like what's on the screen there, like those blue data points, it's not obvious from a, from that approach, how you would connect the dots. There's a bunch of noise, but there's a bunch of like high frequency stuff between X and Y there. Uh, and what this is, is actually observations that, uh, Tycho Brahe used in, um, figuring out the, uh, or that he collected actually, and that Kepler used in figuring out the uh, the dynamics of planetary orbits, and uh, and when you see the theory on that data, it fits really well. But it would be very tough to come up with the theory the theory purely based on uh, looking at that data. Um, so uh, so I think that's the downside of statistical econometric modeling, which is not what I do. So I'm kind of trying to lead into the mathematical modeling. Um, so I mentioned machine learning is great for classification problems like this again, uh, but computational modeling, um, there's agent-based models where you put in the rules and then you see what happens. Uh, but the approach that I typically take is differential equation based. So you have some set of equations and in those equations are, is encoded some conceptual, uh, ideas, uh, and those can be. That encoding can then be like what it implies can be looked at in a purely computational sense or it can be looked at through mathematical analysis so i typically go with these simpler tractable models of this type um, where there are fewer variables and maybe some non-linearity typically that leads to um sometimes unexpected or non-intuitive behavior this is a graph from a project on how languages can compete for speakers but um, but looking at these tractable, tractable models often has the advantage that you can explore the parameter space fully without, um, which is much harder to do in numerical approaches. Um, what do I have? I have all of my, sorry, I've got the zoom window blocking half of what I'm looking at. Let me 
shrink that. Oh yeah. So this was uh this was this other graph that just came up. It's from a project about left-handedness. How we expect left-handedness to emerge when a species is relatively cooperative. Um, and until then, you expect about 50% to be lefty and 50% righty. Um, so you can understand things like that and bifurcations that occur when you uh, when you have these simpler conceptual or tractable, sorry, I should say simpler, mathematical and tractable models. <clears throat> so that's my my main interest, uh, they can be mechanistic models that come from uh, ground up kind of microscopic principles like from physics or empirical, where we take a guess based on data as at what we think is happening. Um, it can be stochastic or deterministic. I, I'm interested in both. Um, this was, oh, that picture was related to a model for um, how um, how spore size in plants evolved and why there is um, this phenomenon called heterospory where there's a multimodal distribution of spore sizes. And this has has some reason, some uh, impact on allergies, it also has impacts on farming. Um, uh, there's also one final interpretation I would say of for what is a model in the medical community, which might refer to an animal like a mouse. So many, many different meanings for model. The one that, uh, that resonates most with me is tractable mathematical modeling. Um, and I think it gives you feedback on the concepts that go into the uh, into the creation of that model. And just to continue with this art theme that I started on. So that was the picture from the, the first slide of my presentation. The one on the left there is the windmill is also another painting by Pete Mondrian. And uh, you can see his kind of progression over his career. These are in uh, chronological order. He developed this abstract style that this last one is kind of what he's best known for is the horizontal and vertical primary color quadrants. And, <clears throat> and I think the, the, um, the metaphor or the, uh, the point I'm trying to make with the art is that, uh, it, at their, at its best tractable, simplified mathematical modeling can give you that, um, the core of what you're looking at, whether it's a tree or or uh, windmill or whatever it is, as you abstract away the detail that is not necessary to get the the broad point, you learn something and maybe you create something of beauty, uh, as I see it with with simplified mathematical models. <clears throat> so um, so I think uh, this process of developing these mathematical models gives you a lot of insight. In the case of like a pendulum bob, knowing that uh, the mass of the pendulum doesn't matter, at least in certain limits, uh, at least and at least for the purpose of knowing what its frequency of oscillation is, that's a great insight that's very important. Um, when that applies and when that doesn't apply is also a useful thing to learn. Um, in an earlier project on language competition that I mentioned, you know, we learn we get this insight from the simplified modeling that coexistence is very difficult, that languages should tend to compete with one another to extinction, at least in a small, well-mixed area. Um, in the case of this animal ornamentation problem, this idea that um, ornaments must handicap an individual, an individual can lead to the, the implication that subspecies should emerge when ornaments are, are present. <clears throat> so the starting from perhaps a conceptual model and then going into the mathematical side can lead to lots of interesting insight. Um, lots of other benefits just to get me uh, get to maybe the more or one of the more relevant uh, upshots here. Um, um, I wanted to go to what I'm calling a social system. And so for me, it's not just social behavior in humans. I use this phrase very broadly to indicate that the individual dynamics are tied to everyone else, the dynamics of all the other individuals in a population. So sort of in a game theoretical sense, uh, my best move at the moment is uh, dependent on everybody else, but everybody else's best move at the moment but in a continuous time system, as opposed to the way game theory is typically depicted as like a binary choice with discrete time. Um, 
in some cases, these problems are referred to as sociophysics, like to what extent do people behave like atoms? How are we predictable? And yeah, to what extent and when when is that a reasonable approximation? Uh, so it overlaps with behavioral economics somewhat, but th that's more driven by this other sense of modeling, which is more regression and correlation driven rather than dynamical systems. I'd say it's you can see that difference as top down versus bottom up. Um, and like the areas of topics of interest in this field are some of the big ones are like how populations change over time, languages change, how peoples move around, uh, demographics, voting, fads, all those things I find very interesting. Um, but I also extend the area of application to things like uh, evolutionary dynamics. I mentioned animal ornaments and heterospory. These are problems of evolution where the individual actor is maybe um, uh, at the species level um, and the changes are happening over long time periods. And the holy grail of all of this, I'd, I would say, is quantitative prediction. Um, I'm not obsessed with that, but I do like to have data on these problems to at least constrain models. Um, so we would like to be able to make quantitative predictions that are accurate, but that's balanced by the desire also, in my mind, for, for relatively simple models. So I think there's a role for both for maybe more detailed and simplified models. Um, I'll just put up this list, which I could go into great detail on, of some of the problems I've worked on uh, with the left side mostly resulting in papers and being sort of successes, the right side being things that I've thought about but not published on yet, and maybe they're in progress or maybe they didn't work out, something like that. Um, so, and these are all problems within this category, I would say, of social systems. So maybe I'll stop there to keep it to around 10 minutes. And um, and I think we're also reaching the end time and see if there are questions. I'll speak to that as a co-director of NICO. I would say that uh, I encourage, I would, Personally, my own students, I encourage them to go to NICO and interact with people there. NICO has a seminar series every Wednesday that's very well attended. We serve some lunch with the seminars so that may be part of it. But even, even during COVID, it was very well attended when there was no lunch. Uh, so that's one way people can get evolved, involved. People NICO also uh, organizes like hackathons or data science nights uh, around different themes that students can go to. Um, there's even office space there if, if students want to hang out more at the physical location where Nico's is, which is down, a little bit down the street. Um, so I think um, it makes a lot of sense, depending on what you're working on, there's more or less overlap with what other people at Nico are interested in. And um, I think it's encouraged in general. Uh, Neil points out, yeah, students can also organize the hackathons. You don't just have to go to one that someone else is running. There's also a reading group, a complex systems reading group that uh, that you can join. And those Wednesday seminars are usually hybrid. So if you wanted to dial in, you can just, you know, log in. And That's right. And many of them are recorded. Actually, this these slides I'm presenting were from uh, a seminar I gave last year, and it's probably, I, I believe, on if you scroll back enough, you'll see something about that on the on the list of past seminars. So you can see some of their seminars or attend them in the future every Wednesday at noon Central Time. I should say ours are also the applied math seminars. We also we don't have them archived online, I don't believe, but we have them uh, hybrid as well. Yeah, no, we are actually we are starting to archiving. I mean, we have, we have now a collection of three talks on. I mean, we, essentially this quarter we started to actually record them. Okay. I mean, not not anyway. Yeah, so you can always look there. Um. Well, any any general questions? As we said, you know, we earlier we said, well, let's um maybe hold off with those until everybody has presented something because some people have to leave. Well, okay, so you, you've met me, quote, met uh, now a bunch of us, so to speak. So if there are any questions coming up later, feel free to shoot us an email any time.
you you know you find our emails on the on the web easily. We'll be more than happy to answer any other questions that come up in when you're looking for graduate school and where to apply and what you know what would be a good choice for you. I mean everybody everybody is different and so people like different things. And for instance, one thing we didn't mention, but it's pretty obvious when you look at the website, we're not a very large department. We're just we're, quote only applied math. I mean we're not math. So like we're not like 10 people in a math department of 60 people, but rather we are 11 faculty in applied math. So that makes more, uh, uh, I don't want to call it, intimate is probably a little bit exaggerated, but it's a, it's a different situation. I remember I once visited somebody at uh, Urbana, University of Illinois Urbana in the physics department, and that faculty member didn't even know all the people in the department office because and the department of people also, they, you know, once you have 60, 70 people in the department, then it becomes a different. So they, we're a different operation. So, it, but, you know, but for some people, they would say, well, this is too small for me. And for other people say, well, that's exactly what I want. I want to have, you know, uh, I want to know everybody. And so the other the factors like that come into play also. Anyway. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your interest. And um, yeah, that's that's what we thought we would um, tell you. And um, maybe we'll uh, Erwin, I'm responding to there is one question in the in the chat, oh. um, which I was responding to by text, but I guess I could just say it. Um, yes, so yes. for the GRE, um, we do not take the GRE. So it 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 might say optional in various places, but but we don't look at the GRE anymore. So um, so you're not required to take it. We don't look at it anyway. So no GRE. Um, yeah. As far as application fee waivers, um, yes. we have that it is possible to get application fee waivers if you are a domestic student, meaning you're not international. Um, uh, unfortunately, we aren't able to offer uh, fee waivers for international students at this time. Um, and so, and if you have, if you want to apply for a fee waiver, um, send an email. I put my, the email for the, the general grad application process. It's esamgrad at northwestern.edu. I put it in the chat. Um, if you have, if you want to pursue a, an application fee waiver, just send me an email and I'll get you connected to the right people that can help you with the process. Um, I it's I can't promise what will happen, but um, but I can at least get you started on it if if you're interested. So um, anyway, that, so that's I, I is that with the with uh, international students? Is that uh, a fixed thing? There are no exceptions. I, I there's no exceptions. Yeah. It, no, no. They, we they tried it for a while and then they stopped doing it. So we don't have we don't have the ability to do it anymore. Um, oh. But I will say, I mean, and this is something that that we haven't talked about. But it, but um, you know, I will talk to talk about it when I call students later. Um, is that um, you know there is no fee waiver, but on the other hand, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that our graduate students, you you will not have to pay for graduate school. Um, you we will get a you get your tuition is covered by the university um, for your entire time. Uh, uh, well, for five years, which is the typical amount of time. If it goes longer than five years, we usually find a way anyway. Um, but anyway, tuition is covered. Um, you will also get a stipend of a, a little over, uh, there's a just about $40,000 a year. I can't remember what the exact number is. Um, and plus health insurance. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it's, it's uh, you know, this, this is a worthwhile investment. Um, so um, you'll find that our financial offers are generally um, uh, very competitive with anybody else in, in the country. So um, anyway, so I just want to toss that out to answer that question. And, and um, you know, that's sort of an area we didn't really talk about today. Okay. Good. Okay, so thank you very uh, much. And, well, uh, hang on, there's one more question there. Oh, no, oh, sorry. Diversity and inclusivity, I'll let you deal with that. There's a, it, there's a question in the chat. On diversity and inclusivity, well, it's a it's a very high priority for for Northwestern to be inclusive for uh, 
in all respects, right? Uh, and so, I mean, they're making a very, when I say they, it's because it's the higher administration. We are included, of course, in terms of those efforts. I mean, there are, because, we, because of the, the Supreme Court ruling uh, this past year, uh, there are some formal uh, you know, changes that had to be made, but it's very, I mean, we're, I would say, well, I would claim we're very open-minded and we definitely want to, we appreciate that uh, different people bring different points of view, different abilities, different perspectives to the table. And uh, that makes a richer table as when you have more, you know, so um, formally, I mean, if, you, if you're wondering in terms of formally like this, the, 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 uh, the university can't do any affirmative action anymore. But they can and do encourage specifically, I think, in the essay questions to say, well, where inclusivity and you know, where these aspects have touched individuals. It's the categorical affirmative action, which is not possible. But if if somebody can uh, you know just talk about their own experience and that's then that's that's relevant. So I don't know whether that was yes. your question, but that's maybe you, it's you want to add something, yes. Well, I think it, from the student perspective, maybe it's useful to talk about the affinity groups. I think that Northwestern has, uh, you know, yes. women in math, uh, a number of affinity groups for Black and Hispanic uh, right. students, right? Like there's, there are very strong, I think, support systems across campus to support diversity. Um, certainly, a lot of my students are international, and there's a fairly uh, strong cohort of just supporting people who are international and haven't had to navigate um, either the US or Northwestern type institution before. So um, I, I would say, I think, you know, from what I see, there's good community and good community in supporting and creating environments for different affinity groups. Uh, I think generally speaking, all universities are grappling with what that means, but, you know, Northwestern definitely tries to put put some amount of money and things behind this to make it real rather than just window dressing. So there's, and uh, there are, um, so we're a small department, so it's, it's harder for us to do a lot of things, you know, have an affinity group that is it, it, too small. It just doesn't have critical mass, but, but um, there are groups such as um, the uh, NSBE, which is a national society society for black engineers. There's also um uh, the corresponding Hispanic one, um, and these are organized through the school, so through the School of Engineering. So it's a broader, a larger group of students, so that you have a, a, essentially a critical mass within those groups that are geared towards graduate students. That are, um, and, and so, um, so we do have connections with them, um, uh, and our students take advantage of it when they when they feel the need. So, um, so there there are opportunities. Um, uh, within the school, even even if they don't may not appear on our website, they they are part of the school. So if you look up um, those kind of programs, whatever you're interested in, um, you can look them up through the um, look them up through the McCormick School of Engineering, and you'll see the what um, other groups are available to everyone in the school, including our department. Although I'll point out that I think the uh, well, there's. The Society of Women Engineers would be in that school, but the Association for Women in Math is maybe in Weinberg, or it's a national organization, but the it's organized primarily by the math department, but our students can participate as well. And there's Society of Women Engineers as well, so that's yeah. which is also in McCormick. Maybe yeah. more specific to the math community, um, the Society for Industrial Engineering and Applied Mathematics, which are, our students do have a chap student chapter within our department, um, I think tends to run very good uh, affinity pro programs generally across their different conferences and things like that. So, you know, all of us are very highly connected on the applied math side and what our community is outside of the university, I think to groups that are, are really thinking about these things and, and creating space. Okay. Thanks everybody for your contributions and questions and um, 
I wish you a good, whatever it is, afternoon, morning, depending on where you are. Um, it's been good to talk with you. And and best wishes for all of you on uh, on your search for a graduate school. Yep. Um, yep. Hope yes. you hope here, but um, you know, I know that uh, not every place is for everyone. So, um, uh, but you know, just wish you best on all of it.